liver, they start having blood, so they die. It's what we call the doctors multi organic failure. the main cause of death in the body. It's what I said, like, if the big organs of the body, which allow us to be alive, stop working because they don't get the blood and the energy that they need to work, they die. And then we cannot live when our liver starts failing, our kidney starts failing, the brain, and then in the end it's the heart, and then we die. Okay. The problem with Ebola is like it has a lot of symptoms that also can produce complications. For example, Ebola is mainly fever, okay, uh, diarrhea, vomiting. Those are the three things that are really more visible when we see Ebola patients. Okay. What happens if you vomit a lot and if you have a lot of diarrhea? You lose a lot of liquid, no? Mm -hmm. Okay. If you don't recover all that liquid, which is gonna, what is going to happen in your body? Your body is going to get dry, going to get dehydrated. Okay. When your body doesn't have volume of liquid enough, your kidneys are not working, so they fail. So they go. Apart from this, you also have problem of. Hydration. Okay. Oh. What? So, yeah. Okay. So, the main problem with this, also, apart from multi organic failure and the dehydration, there's also one thing. At that time, you're really weak. Okay, you're losing a lot of volume of fluids, your main organs are failing, you're really, really weak, you're really, really sensitive at that time to anything which is around you. And what happens? Malaria is around us, a lot of bacterial infections are around us, like typhoid, Shigella, Leucinia, E. coli, a lot of diarrhea problems caused by bacteria. So you're really, really weak, and it's really easy for you to get anything that is around you. Normally you're strong, your immune system is fighting against malaria and other things all the time. But when all your defenses go down, it's really easy that you get affected and attacked by all the things that normally you would control, but now you cannot, because your immune system is going down. So you have what we call the doctors, the super infection. Okay, super infection is when you have one thing, and then, plus that, you develop something new because you are weak, okay? So it's the super infection. That normally should, in this context, right now, <laughs> is malaria and bacterial infection. The most common is typhoid. <laughs> okay? So, now you can understand a little bit why people... These are the causes of death of Ebola. Okay? The multi-organic failure, but also the dehydration and the superinfection. Okay? Then, what happens? This virus getting gets inside your body. They don't. The virus doesn't attack from the first moment. Okay. Normally, it needs some time, some time to replicate and to start damaging your inside. Okay. This not, doesn't happen in one day, two days. Normally, it's what we call the incubation period, which is the time that the virus is inside your body until he gets comfortable inside and starts attacking and doing all these things about the micro vessels that I was explaining to you about the 
more bureaucratic way now, okay? So normally this incubation period is around three days, three weeks, more or less. So you can see it's a lot of time. So maybe you're in contact with a patient who has a border and you feel good afterwards. The next day, you feel okay. The next week, you feel okay. And then you start having symptoms two weeks later. Why? Why does it happen like that? Because, okay, you have your body. I'm really bad. I don't know, I don't know. Uh, so you have the virus here, gets inside, okay, it starts replicating. So right here you're feeling okay, but after two, three weeks, what the virus has been multiplying itself. And go into all these small vessels that I was explaining to you before, okay? Okay, of course, I am assuming that you don't think that you're going to have a spot all over your body. This is inside your body, okay? Yeah. Inside your vessel. And just a picture. So it's inside, so it's replicating a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And then in two weeks, what happens? This is like the wall, like, like an army. You only have one soldier, and it work. But then suddenly, if you wait, they get more soldiers, more soldiers, and then they are a lot, and they start doing what they have to do. They just attack and they attack your body. So normally, this makes sense when you think about transmission, okay? Because a lot of people say like, oh, if, I, if I'm in a taxi, if I'm in a bar having one drink with someone, maybe he has Ebola and he's infected me. And that's what we say like, the only way to transmit the disease is having symptoms. And now you understand why. Because you need a big amount of virus to transmit. Okay, and unless you have symptoms, you cannot transmit the disease. Why? Because your soldiers are not enough to be transmitted to other people. Okay? As soon as you have enough soldiers in your army, is when you start feeling weak, <laughs> you start feeling fever, diarrhea, vomiting, and that's when you are infectious. Okay? When you have one or two soldiers, it's really, really almost impossible that you transmit anything. Because you only have one or two soldiers, okay? The problem is when they are too many and they produce symptoms. So that's why our sensitization is really important. It's when people like, it doesn't matter if you shake hands with someone who is sick, okay, healthy, okay? I know that it's, it's important to prevent and to show people that we have to wash our hands and these, all these things really, really positive, it's really good, but for other things, not only for Ebola. Okay? Mm -hmm. The Ebola thing, the important thing that you have to have in your mind is the sick people. Mm -hmm. If you see someone with fever, diarrhea, vomiting, frustrated, really weak, really tired with fever, you have to say to that person, you can have Ebola. You have to go to the hospital because if you stay at home, you are a risk for all your family. Because it's when your soldiers are really strong and they can be transmitted to other people. So what happens with Ebola? It's transmitted mainly in the caregivers, nurses, doctors, and the family members who are taking care of someone. Okay? That's why you see a lot of doctors, a lot of nurses, and very close contacts of the family getting infected. Because if, if you are sick, is when you can transmit the virus really easily. The first place where you can find the virus is the blood. As you can imagine, it affects the, the blood, the micro vessels, okay? But when the disease is quite advanced, you can imagine that you can find it everywhere. Sweat, urine, stools, uh, saliva, okay? But you need to be very sick, which means that you have a lot of soldiers in the side of your body. Okay. Now, it's just common sense. What happens if you are just starting feeling, I'm not feeling really well. You have like five, six soldiers, but not thousands of them. You are not really contagious. So at that time, shaking your hand, or sharing a taxi, or sharing a drink, is not going to transmit any disease, okay? The problem is when you are really, really sick, that's when you get really infectious, okay? 
So this is very important. Why? Because I know and we know that here really the healthcare system is quite weak. And also you have to pay to go to the hospital. And many people cannot afford to go to the hospital all the time. And also the hospitals are quite far away from some villages. So it's quite difficult to take someone to the hospital or whatever. And also I know that when you love really much someone and that person is sick, you want to take care of him by yourself. And like I'm, I, you want to show that person how much you care. And you want to take care of him and everything. But in this disease, you can imagine that we cannot do that. So for us, it's a really big challenge right now. Because trying to change the mentality about taking people to the hospital is really, really complicated. You know? And also, there's one thing that probably you have heard in the beginning. Many people talk about Ebola like, oh, this is a horrible disease. If you get Ebola, you die. <laughs> and if you go to the hospital, someone is going to give you an injection and you're going to die because of that infection. And injection, and infection, and because of this, you're going to die. That's the thing that everybody had in their mind in the beginning, okay? And now. So, many people could think like, why should I go to the hospital if I'm going to die anyway? <laughs> I just want to stay at home. They say that there's no cure for this. I don't go to the hospital, I don't spend the money of my family. I just stay home, and if I have to die, I die. And also, there's something about our mind which is amazing. This is our psychology. Like, sometimes you feel, if nobody tells me that I have a bona, it's like if I don't have a bona. You know? Mm -hmm. You feel sick. You can think like, maybe I have a bona, but nobody has told me that I had a bona. So, I still feel like, maybe I don't have it. So, you prefer to stay at home and not go to the doctor, just in case he tells me that I have a bona, and then I start thinking oh, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna get very sick, I'm gonna so it's something psychological. It's the human mind, it's amazing. How we manipulate our thoughts to feel better, okay? So this is part of your job and your work right now. Now you understand this thing about the soldiers, okay? Mm -hmm. And you understand that when someone gets blood soldiers inside the body, even the minimum touch can infect. And what happens to the people who are taking care of them at home? They all get it. So it's going to be one, it's going to be two. This is going to be four. So what is happening in Sierra Leone right now? This. It's spreading. Uh, from one, then suddenly, in three days, or in two weeks, sorry, suddenly you have 20. Because of one case. Because this person was taken care by these two people. Then these two people got infected and they started having symptoms and they were taken care by these two people. So now we have four. So it's okay, it's spreading, exponential. Okay? So what happens if this person goes to the hospital in the beginning? Okay? And he's isolated and taken the blood sample and he's positive. And he's sent to the two special hospitals for Ebola that we have in Sierra Leone, in Kailam and Kenema. This person goes there. Okay, there's a probability of dying. I'm not gonna lie to you. Many people die. Half of the patients die. Okay, that's the big truth. But half of the people survive. And if you go in the first stages, with your common sense, you will understand why. Mm -hmm. If you go to the hospital and they give you treatment for at least these two things, most of the causes of death are prevented. We cannot do anything like this because this, the bone thing, we don't have any treatment for this virus. But we have treatment for this. We can give fluids, we can give antibiotics, we can give antimalarials. So, at least the deaths that are related to dehydration and superinfection, we can prevent them, okay? So, it's really important. What happens if this first person goes to the hospital and is sent to Kenema, Thailand, and is given the fluids and everything? 
has 50% of probability of survival, which is the most amazing thing, okay? 50% of probability of dying, that's a bad thing, but he has gone to the hospital. This chain is not, it is completely closed, so no one else is affected. Yeah. You understand how important it is to sensitize people to go to the hospital. Yeah? And right now, what we are trying to do with the ministry, which is quite hard, but we are trying to do is trying to sort out all these difficulties about going to the hospital. For example, putting more ambulances all around the country. So then you know, so then people can be transferred to hospitals quite easily. Second. Uh, Ebola treatment with fluids, antibiotics, and malaria and everything is free, so they don't have to pay. So you can come to the hospital and you don't have to have money. Okay? Third of all, we are trying to talk to people and to train the doctors and the nurses to know exactly what they have to do if they have an Ebola patient. So we are working for the ministry, now we need some work from the community. And this is about talking about this. Okay? Okay. Another thing which is important, um, what happens with a patient that starts having fever, vomiting, diarrhea, and weakness, which is the most important. I think I'm going to write down this. I think then you can know what are the symptoms? Fever? Sorry? Oh, color. Oh. Come on. Come on, it's really big. It's really big, I think. It's a big deal, I'm going to say. These are the things that I want you to remember. I'm sorry, I know my clinic is not really good. Fever, diarrhea, and vomiting, and weakness. Okay, how many different things you can think that you can have with this symptom? Everything that gives you fever gives you weakness. When you have fever, what happens? You feel oh, weak, frustrated, tired. So this is very specific, no? Diarrhea and vomiting. Typhoid can give you diarrhea and vomiting. Food poisoning can give you diarrhea and vomiting. So now you can imagine, I want you to put yourself in the place of one doctor who is seeing patients, okay, and think, how many people a day can you see in a hospital with fever, diarrhea, vomiting, and weakness? A lot. Because there are many different things like malaria, typhoid, any gastrointestinal infection, food poisoning. But in babies, I don't want to tell you in babies, babies have diarrhea for everything. They are always with diarrhea, things like that. So, we are facing a big problem right now in the hospital. In the beginning, what we did is like, as you can imagine with this, you need to have a close contact with someone with Ebola to get Ebola. Ebola is not transmitted in the air, it's transmitted by contact. And contact with fluids, mainly blood. But in later stages, as I told you before, sweat, urine, feces, and saliva can transmit it, but you have to be very, very sick. A lot of soldiers inside of your body, okay? But you need to have that contact with someone sick. You cannot get Ebola from nothing, okay? It's not like the mosquito of malaria, or like water with typhoid or cholera, okay? You need to be taking care of someone, and touch him, and to wash him, and whatever. So, What's that? what we ask always, when we see one patient in the hospital with this, is like, have you ever had contact with anyone who was sick? Okay? And mainly we were focused on Kenem and Kailan, which were the first places affected. So if someone had traveled to Kenem or Kailan or had 
had contact with someone from Kerala Kalam and they have this symptom. We just thought that, oh, it could be a bona. Now we have a problem since one month ago. You know why? Because people here in Sierra Leone travel a lot and they move everywhere. They are always moving from one place to the other. So, a lot of people who are in Kenema and Kailan and have contact with people who are infected, they are in the incubation period, they are feeling okay, and they come to free time to do business. Or they go to boat to visit their relatives. Or they travel to, I don't know, to, to Lugi or Lusa to spend a weekend with their family who live there. And then they start feeling sick. So now we cannot think only in Kenema and Kailau because we have cases everywhere. Okay? So now, that thing that we were using about Kenema and Kailau is over. Now we have to think that you can meet Ebola everywhere. But now you know, it's not in the air, it's not in the things, it's not in a normal contact. You need to be sick. To be with someone who's sick in this case. Okay, so since now on, every time that you hear that someone is sick with this kind of things, even if you think, oh, it's malaria, don't assume it's malaria, okay? It's probably it's going to be malaria, but maybe not. Okay, so you have to tell everyone, when you feel sick, you have to go to the hospital, okay? So, second thing. Maybe it's quite obvious, but I think it's really important to reinforce it. It's not only, okay, what happens with dead people, okay? I'm very, very sick with Ebola and then I die in my house. And what happens with my family? What is my family going to do with me? For example? Okay. Ah, you said that first. What are you going to do to me? They are going to wash me. Okay. What happens if they wash you? They have a bowl now. Okay. So, it's not only the person who's taking care of me. It's also all the people who are going to work in my funeral. Uh-huh. <laughs> so now we have a big problem. Yeah. And you know, that's, that's, you know what, what happens with that? It makes me laugh a lot. That's the white people problem. We don't understand that. Because we don't do it. So, yeah, no, we just say like, oh no, no, why Ebola is so spread? My mom was asking me the other day on the phone, like, what happens in Africa? That's crazy. The Ebola should be completely controlled at this level. And it's like, mom. This, is, this doesn't work like, like this, like you think. You have an idea about this. But here things are different. And you have to adopt your mentality to here. And understand why so many people are getting infected here. Because when somebody dies, all the family go together. All the friends go together. And then everyone who really felt something for that person wants to collaborate and wants to be part of it. So, all the people who are washing the body are at risk. All the people who are hugging the body or kissing the body are at risk. All the people who are cleaning the clothes, or the bed clothes or everything, are at risk. So now we have a big problem. And that's what we have now, all of these cases, you know? So, I think it's important that we all reflect about this because Changing the mentality and the tradition of a country is really hard. Yeah? But if we start explaining people what happens with this, maybe we can try to organize things better. What we do now is we have dead people, okay? And we take the body and we bury it without letting them wash it. You can imagine how disappointed and how upset families are. They feel that you are still in the body. Okay. And they, they get angry with the doctors and with the barrel too. 
It's like you don't you don't allow us to raise our people. But you know why it's so important that we don't allow families to take care of the dead bodies. Because the dead body is when you have more soldiers inside. So any minimal contact can be your big mistake. It can affect you. So this is an important thing. And I think it's really important to try to transmit this information to everyone. Okay. It's not that we don't respect the funeral or we don't respect the dead people. It's like it's really risky and the only way to make it could be dressing up with all the protection here um, the people who are treating the body. But this is really, really complicated. But I want you to understand the meaning of sick people and dead people are the most risky ones. Okay. So what happens? Now let's see the situation. I'm I'm in boat, I'm with my family, someone gets sick at home, I don't know exactly what happened, and I decide to take care of that person because I think it's malaria, that's the normal thing. This person starts having fever, later two, three days later, weakness, very weak. That's one of the things that we see, they are really weak. They can they are not able even to walk. Or even to drink, they they cannot even take a glass to so very weak, very the fever, and then in the after one week more or less they start with a lot of diarrhea and vomiting. Okay? So I take care of him and he dies and we we bury him but with all the traditional things that we are used to do, so five, ten people are involved with that. One week later, nothing happens. Two weeks later, then I start having fever. And then I start having fever. But with me, 10 people. From one, now we have 11. Yeah? You see that? So, we should stop it in the beginning. If one person dies, it's horrible, but 11 people die. That's a tragedy. Then a family. I've seen it. The mother, the father, the son, and the daughter die all together, one big family, just because they wanted to take care of one of the other. This is this is not a joke anymore. Anyway. This is, has to be serious. This has to change completely our way of doing things. Okay, even if it's against our tradition, we have to be intelligent and smart and try to adapt everything to this. Okay, so. Uh, it's not only bad news, okay? One thing that I want you to remember is that this is an outbreak. This kind of diseases go in outbreak. What does that mean? It's not that we are going to have Ebola forever. It never happens, happens like that, okay? We have had outbreaks like this all over Africa and Asia and part of South America before, okay? Normally, it happens. The virus gets really strong, comes, attacks a lot of people, and then progressively lose power and then goes down. Okay, right now the problem is that the word outbreak is that if you look at that up in the dictionary. So outbreak. The outbreak goes like this, okay? Like, start progressively. No, 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 this, this is a bubble. I, I want, I want to keep a bubble. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we love the little sound of the bubble. So, an outbreak goes like this. Goes the first case, second case, third case, and then goes up, blah, 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 and then starts going down until it disappeared. If this has happened in Uganda, Sudan, and Congo, those three countries have had at least 10 different outbreaks, each one in the last 30, 40 years. 
okay? What happens? This is our first outbreak. It doesn't mean that it's going to happen again. Maybe it doesn't happen again, ever again. But maybe, yes, we should be aware. If you go to Uganda, I was living in Uganda last year, no, 2012. They are amazing, you cannot imagine. Everybody knows about Ebola. Everybody knows. Everybody. They know a lot of about Ebola, the symptoms, how to do it, how to bury the bodies, how to kill the bodies, how to be pre prevented, how to start doing all the PHUs and dispensaries. But what, why? Because this is probably their 12th outbreak of Ebola. And also they have another one which is called Marmon, which is quite similar. So they know a lot about that. But they are experienced. So right now when they have an outbreak, they have maybe five or ten cases, and they control it. Okay? So, the thing about the outbreak is this. Outbreak is not like malaria. Malaria is a disease that lives around us. And it doesn't go in peaks, it goes flat. Okay? We always have malaria. Okay? But Ebola goes like this. Even whatever we do, there's going to be a moment when it's going to go, start going down because the virus loses its strength and doesn't infect so much. Okay, it's gonna happen, but we don't know when. Maybe it's in two months, three months, four months. We don't know that, okay? But one day we're gonna meet here in two, three months or four, and we are gonna talk about the whole experience before, and everything is gonna be over. That's the good news. But we have to try to control it as much as we can to prevent that so many people die because of this. Okay. So, this is an outbreak. This is really important to remember, okay? Because many people are saying like, oh, this is a gentlemental day, we are gonna die, all of us. This is gonna <laughs> destroy all of us. This is the end of our times, and everything. And that's not true. This will disappear, I promise you. One day, the virus is not gonna be so powerful anymore. But maybe we have an outbreak like this in two, three years before. Okay. Why happen? Why it happens in this environment? Okay, because we never hear, hear anything about Ebola in U.S. or Ebola in France or whatever. Okay. First of all, the bush makes a difference. Okay. This is a disease which lives in bush animals, like bats and monkeys. Okay. And for any reason, we don't know exactly how. And if somebody tells you that they know, they are lying to you completely. Because we don't know. We don't have any clue about why. But at certain point, it go, comes from the animals to the humans. Maybe, because in the bushes, I've heard that some people eat some animals from the bush, or whatever, I don't know. But the thing is, they get infected by the animals. And then is when the outbreak starts. Okay? But this starts from animals. So that's why it happens in this kind of cases where the bush is quite productive and big and we still have bush animals. Okay? So Uganda, Sudan and Congo have had many outbreaks before. Okay, the first one were really horrible. The next one people were ready, more education, more trained people experienced people about how to do things, which helps. The problem here now is that nobody knows anything about this. And even if you bring international help, most of the people from other countries don't have any clue about what to do. Okay, most of the first experts and the most important ones went to Guinea when everything started. But they cannot be in three countries at the same time. So we are trying to train people, but this takes time. Not a day, not something that we can do from one moment to the other. So, okay, we have those symptoms. We have already talked about the incubation period. You have you have symptoms. You get really sick, and then you go to the hospital. Okay, because that's the message that I want you to remember. Go to the hospital. What is going to happen to me in the hospital? Okay. People are really scared of hospitals and doctors and nurses and everything. And uh, shots and I'm going to die and this is what's going to happen and whatever. And also, you see the news and you see these people wearing these astronaut dresses. Yeah. Vomiting, 
they have witnessed. You try to get a history of that patient, good one, and he ends up admitting, I was taking care of one of my customers, and he died one month ago. Okay. You always have to look for the history of a contact, because as I said before, this doesn't come in the air. You need to have had a contact with someone. Sometimes, two or three weeks back, people forget things, or they are scared and they lie, and they don't tell the truth, or whatever. So, you go to that, and uh, as you can imagine, this person has symptoms. I'm a doctor, I'm seeing this patient. What shall I do? I have to protect myself. Okay? Because I'm gonna examine this patient. I'm gonna touch him. Okay, I'm gonna see if he has fever. Also he said, Oh, I have diarrhea, so I'm gonna touch his belly and I have to protect myself. Okay, so I'm gonna wear gloves, I'm gonna wear an apron just in case he oh vomit on me, which happens a lot. <laughs> okay? So it's really important that I protect myself. But there must be a test that I can do, no? How do you diagnose diseases like this? You can know it by the symptoms, but as you know, these symptoms are very specific. You can have many different things with these symptoms. So, I need a good test to tell me this has Ebola, this has an Ebola. So, we have two laboratories that can make this kind of test in the country right now. We try it. Kenema and Kaila. They are not normal tests. This is not like the malaria test that you can do with a drop of blood. Or the HIV test that you can do with a drop of blood. Okay? You need a proper tube of blood. And we do two tests. Just to be sure. Because this is not a very silly diagnosis. If you diagnose someone from Ebola, it's a huge deal. So you have to be very sure that the test is not failing, and there is not a false positive, or made a mistake, or whatever. So we do two different tests, okay? One of them is called the serology, made ELISA, and it's the detection of the antigen. You have already studied some immunology. I don't know if you know what is the antigen, yeah? No. The antigen yeah. is this molecule. Inside a um, human being, human, no, sorry, a living uh, bag or whatever, that is the one that detects and activates all our immune system, all our antibodies. Okay? So we can detect that antigen, and the antigen lives in the surface of the virus. So we can detect that. Okay? We do one thing called serology. Why serology? Because we take the serum of the blood and we use one system called ELISA. It's like a it's called ELISA because in the beginning it was a machine called ELISA. Then they we just keep on doing that. This is a technique that we use with the serum, the serology, to detect the antigen. Okay, there's a lot of antigen on the virus. So we can detect it, and then we know it's possible. Okay? This takes around three, four hours. Okay? And also we have another, because of the implications that I wasn't explaining to you before. Saying that someone has a bone, it's not a joke. Okay, so we have to be sure that we don't make a mistake because there are some antigens of other bugs, other viruses, that could interfere with this test. So we can have a positive, and it's not a real positive, it was a mistake. Okay, a um, cross reaction, what we call. So we do another one, this is called PCR. Okay. The PCR is very simple to explain. We detect DNA of the virus. Okay? 
What is complicated to explain is all the technique of the bio, of the molecular biology that they use to do it in the laboratory. It's quite a complex test because you, what you do is you detect the genomic information of the virus. So, as you can imagine, if you detect DNA, because the virus exists, there's no mistake about that. Okay. If you have this positive, it's going to be positive for sure. So we do these two things. And this normally takes around one day. A little less, but you can say one day. Okay. This has to be done in a very specific laboratory. Why? Because we could detect, we could just find other kind of DNA if the laboratory is not really clean, not really decontaminated. So it could be a lot of interference. So we need a special laboratory, special people. You can imagine how dangerous it could be for a lab technician to do this. So, so easy to get infected that you need to have a special laboratory with a special trained people around. That's why and many people ask me, why don't we have the test everywhere, like malaria or HIV? That would be really easier, because getting these two tests done in a normal laboratory is completely impossible. Okay. You need to have it in a special condition. It's a high-quality laboratory. And we are lucky because we have two. One in Kenema. Why in Kenema? You know that? You already knew that in Kenema, before Ebola, there was a hospital for Lhasa. Lhasa fever. Yeah? yeah? Yes. You know what is Lhasa? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, Ebola is a cousin of Lhasa. They are family. They are more or less the same. The difference, like Ebola, is more picky and comes in outbreaks. And Lhasa lives here. Okay? The Ebola is this kind of relative that comes sometimes, shows off a little bit. And then they don't know. But he came here with a big car, with a big presser and the big dresses, and the big dresses, and everything. That's Ebola. Lhasa is the one who's staying here all the time. It's not really aggressive, it's normal. It stays here, okay? So we, here in Sierra Leone, had a good thing about having one hospital for Lhasa fever. So we were already prepared for something. So the laboratory only has to notify. They were already doing this PCR test, okay? So we only had to modify a little bit the laboratory, but we could keep on doing it. And then when this laboratory got a bit small, because the cases were increasing, 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 we created Kailau. And many times have come here. Do you know MSF? This NGO, huge NGO that works uh, all over the world in emergencies. Okay. They they are really good at outbreaks and Ebola. They have been working all over the world in all the three countries that we were talking before, and they are amazing. They just can create a treatment center in less than two three days. Great. So they have a laboratory there because our laboratory from Kenema was a bit small for all the cases that we were having. So right now in the country we have two laboratories doing these two tests. Okay. So. Someone is in the is in college, okay? Arrived there, vomiting, diarrhea, weakness, and then I saw him and I think, okay, and he has been taking care of one cousin who died suddenly, mysteriously, a young guy. Why a guy of 24, 20 years old died suddenly? So I just said, oh, hmm, maybe this is a bona. So let's go to protect myself with God to make with this. And I'm going to put this patient in an isolation room. What is an isolation room? It's a room where the patient is inside. Nobody can get inside. He cannot get outside. And I just keep him there to prevent the contact with anyone. And then I prevent that he can transmit the disease to other people. Because he's symptomatic and he's infectious. Okay? What happens in that room? Okay. What I do is I take one sample. Okay, in a tube, and I send the sample to the serology and PCR. But as I told you, the laboratories are in Kenema and Kailau. What happens? It takes time, no? Because imagine this patient comes at night. I can take the sample at night, but I don't have any driver 
or any car to go at 12 at night to Kenema Kailan. And also the laboratory is going to be closed because they need to rest. So I'm going to take the sample probably the next day. So it means that one day to go to Kenema Kailan. It arrives in the afternoon. They prepare it the next day. So how many days am I going to have my patient isolated? At least two, three days until I get the result. Okay, so I have my isolation unit that I will explain to you later. I have, right now I have 30 beds. We are trying to do this in every clinic and hospital like this. You should have a room and put one patient there, okay? Take the lab sample and the patient should stay there until we get the result. Okay, now I want you to think something that is, in my opinion, one of the most Worrying and difficult things. He also wants to know about Ebola. <laughs> so the thing is, uh, imagine it's you. You are just, you have typhoid, vomiting, diarrhea, fever, weakness, and you go to the hospital, and then one doctor says to you with gloves and apron, oh, Maybe you have Ebola. You have to go to this isolation room. And they put you there for three days. Nobody can get inside. You cannot get outside. What do you what how would you feel? Like dying. No? Yeah. So that's the problem we are having with the patients. They are really scared. And you try to explain to them, I'm going to take a sample of your blood. I'm going to send it to the laboratory. In two, three days, I will have the result. You're going to stay in this room in these two, two or three days. I think in the beginning, they don't listen to you. They're just so scared that they, they don't understand you. But the next day, they start saying, hey, doctor, I want to go home. What I'm doing here. So they try to escape. And that's what happened in Kenema when everything started. I, maybe you, you saw it in the media. Like, patients escape from the Kenema Treatment Center. Imagine that, that someone just puts you inside a room without any contact with anyone, and the only people that come inside the room are dressed like an astronaut, <laughs> completely like this. They also avoid touching you, just in case. It's really scary. Really, really scary. Okay. But that's the only way to do it. But it's scary. So we, as healthcare workers who are working there, it's really important we never forget the human part and the emotional part of the patients. Uh, maybe it's risky, but touching them is not bad. Okay. You only have to protect yourself from doing it. But it's really, really, really important that people feel that even if they are going to die, they should die with dignity and with health around. So I think it's important that we all remember this when we say, when we see all the images of the TV of the people of Kailan and Kenema, who's dressed up with this clothes of astronauts touching the patients and everything. And that's why we give it so much importance when we discharge patients from Kenema and Kailan because they are recovered and we send them home. And it's like, that's amazing. These people are a real survivor and they are fighters and real soldiers. It's incredible. So we should think of these people as heroes. Because okay. they have gone through a very, I think the worst thing that can happen to you and it's feeling abandoned inside one world. Right now we have a problem, a huge problem. People are scared, they don't know things about Ebola. And when people recover from Ebola, they go back to the villages. Can you guess what happens? <laughs> Nobody wants to touch them. <laughs> they throw them away. Can you imagine? Just think for a minute, if it was you, how would you feel? <laughs> So, this is, I think it's really important that you take a minute and you think of this. Because we are going to keep on seeing things like this because our mortality rate is around 
it means that 60% of the people are surviving and they're going to go back to their villages and they are going to be rejected. That's really... I don't want you to get really dramatic, okay? We are just going on, but I want you... I'm just giving you some topics that I want to talk about later, okay? What solutions you can think of and options like that. So, one of the things that I want to explain is like, because many people ask me, okay, if we have two, these two tests, I want to get tested if I have a problem, okay? Because um, I want to travel abroad, and if, if I have a Ebola, they don't allow me to travel, or just because I'm worried, because I went to this doctor about Ebola, and I, um, I don't know, I just need to, to, to be tested. We cannot test everyone, for many reasons, and for the first time in our lives, it's not about the money. It's not because it's expensive, which is really expensive, but that's not the problem. It's finance, we have a lot of donations, and we don't have any problems about supply. So that's not the reason. The reason is, we have this, okay? You, we go back to the army. Okay, so, serology detects antigen. PCR detects DNA. What happens if you only have two soldiers inside your body? The test it's going to be negative. Mm -hmm. So during the incubation period, it makes no sense yeah. doing any test because it's going to be negative and I cannot trust that test. For example, I've been treating one patient, okay? And then I know that that person has a Ebola, and then I get scared. Oh, I was with him, I took her, I took care of him, maybe I'm infected, I want the test to be done. No. But we can do it but it's going to be negative, because you only have two soldiers here. You have to wait until you have symptoms. And when you have symptoms, it means that you have a lot of soldiers inside your body, and that's when the antigen and the DNA are present, and you can detect them. Okay. So, that's one of the big things and big problems we have with the contacts. So, the contacts... Uh, we have to follow them. And you can imagine these two, three weeks are really, really scary also. But when you call someone and you say, oh, your sister has died of Ebola. We have to quarantine you for 21 days, just in case you have fever. Those 20, 21 days are horrible for anyone. Does anything? I even feel it myself, and I, I'm with patients, some patients that are positive, and I get up in the morning and sometimes I feel like, oh, I feel a bit hot today, and you start feeling like, oh my god, maybe I, I have Ebola, and imagine that 21 days altogether, that's really, really horrible for everyone, but, okay, so, I also want you to think of that, but that's the way we have to do it, because that's the only way it works. If we do the test before, if it's negative, I'm gonna give I'm gonna say to you it's negative, but come back in two weeks. And you're gonna say, why did you test me? If it, it's not useful. Just, so that's why we have to wait until the patient has the soldiers to detect it. And we cannot do the test before. Okay. So this is one of the big things that we have. I wish with time and you know medicine and science amazing and with time probably we will get a super test that could detect it before but right now during the incubation period for 21 days we cannot detect the soldiers okay so we have the patient here we isolate him for example when I get inside I dress myself with this astronaut dress and I get I give him food water I give him fluids, like a lot, lot, lot of water, even fluids, saline through the, the vein, just in case he cannot drink too much, to prevent the dehydration. I give antibiotics and antimalarials, just to prevent the complications, and I wait for three days until I get the result. The patient is negative. 
really happy. We make a party with them. We get, give them a present. And we try. They are really happy. They go back to the community. If they are still sick, because maybe, you can imagine, we isolated that person for three days and maybe they have another thing. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes they still feel quite weak, so we send them to the ward, the normal one, and if in those three days with the antibiotics, the fluids, the antivirals, they get better, they go home. But what happens with the ones who are positive? We call Kenema and Kailang, and we tell them we have a positive case. So we have a special ambulance, we put the person inside, and we send that person to Kenema and Kailang. And that's when they get admitted then in the two treatment centers, the MSF treatment center and the Lasso Fever treatment center of Kenema. Okay. And that's what you see in the news. Half of the people survive, half of the people uh, die. But the truth is, and I'm completely sincere with this, many people that die is because they last too long to look for help. When they go to the hospital, because they are okay. If you go in the beginning, you prevent at least you can prevent this, which is the the biggest cause of death is this. Okay, so go with the first symptoms is the best way to do it. Okay, what else?
really want to know if like the Ebola virus can stay, I mean like when somebody gets Ebola virus and the person comes in contact with Nigerians like, or French, like the Ebola virus can stay there for a while. And like if someone comes there with who is not infected can get infected because they see the action. Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, Ebola, I told you, is a very icky virus, okay? It only lives in fluids, <coughs> organic fluids. If I put it in coke or fanta or water, it's not going to survive, okay? It needs to have cells and to have um, food from the body, organic fluids, okay? So, normally, I have Ebola and I just touch this, this is a table, Okay. Only five minutes in inorganic things, except if it's blood. Okay? If I if I'm bleeding and the blood just goes, goes here, all the time that the blood is there, the virus is going to be there. Okay. So that's why it's really important about urine, about feces, and about blood. Okay. You just touch in. It's not really living more than five minutes. If it's blood, when the blood is dry, or the urine is dry, or the feces are dry, it lives around two or three hours. And later, it dies. Okay. So normally, if you have something stained with blood, urine, or feces, what we do is put bleach and wait. But even if I don't put bleach, after five hours, the virus is dead. So, this is quite useful just to think of things that are dirty. Uh, oh, and if a bone patient was here, we clean everything with bleach, and that's all. We can do that, no problem. It's not transmission, there's no transmission anymore. And even if we don't clean with bleach, after five hours, that virus will die. Because the three ways of treating a bone virus is bleach or chlorine. Twenty-two people that could have been in contact. So that's 
why it's really important for all of us this kind of meetings and this kind of talkings. And so that's why it's so important you go home and you explain to people like, panicking is not going to solve this. You have to be responsible and have to be smart. Okay, sick people have to go to the hospital. That's the only way to stop this. Oh, yeah, we are working on that, okay? We have, in Canada now, we have 13 beds, or isolated, but it's not a treatment center, you're right. So, everything was in Kailan and Kenema, so the two big centers were there, but now that we start having cases in other parts of the country, we are thinking of having a hospital in the western area, okay? So, LACA is one of the options that we have. We are trying to prepare LACA hospital. And also, Kerry Town? Kerry Town. Kerry Town is another place that we are thinking of constructing one hospital there. But until now, we didn't have cases in Free Town and Western Area. Everything was in the West. So we were thinking of that. But also, think one thing. Creating a hospital means a lot. Like, it's not only doing the building. Like, you need nurses, you need doctors, you need cleaners, and I think you are smart enough to understand that people don't want to work. Yeah. The nurses in Kerema and Kailao are amazing. These people are really heroes. They have been fighting with anyone around them in the community. Can you imagine that many nurses could not go to their houses in Kenema because all their neighbors were rejecting them because they were nurses in contact with the older patients. Like, oh, you are gonna infect all of us. And these people are really heroes because they are risking their lives every day just to treat these patients. So yeah, it's a big challenge for us now. We can create a treatment center, but we need to have people. So we still need to train more people. And also, even with training and with money, some people really, I don't criticize that, it's normal. You, you get scared. You're afraid of what can happen. So, we need a little bit of time, but now we are getting more people, and also people from abroad, but I, I think it's important to get people from here, because this is a problem in the country, I think it's important to be involved with this. So yeah, we're going to have two treatment centers in the western area. We hope that we have, don't have many cases, but anyway, we will have, yeah. No. Except you are very sick because of this. Okay? When you are very, very sick, it could be in your saliva. Okay? But if you are in the incubation period or you are starting, you don't go try to share in the same time. The food or drinks, no. There's no prevention. All these things that are going into the media, the WhatsApp, the Facebook, and all these things about, if you do this or that, you prevent the border. If you do that, or do that. that's completely a lie. It's not true. We don't have any treatment for Ebola. The treatment we give is what I explained to you. Fluids, antibiotics, and malaria to prevent the complications, okay? There's no treatment for Ebola. But, you have read in the media that in the US right now, they have like a serum that you can use uh, as a research for patient problems. Okay, there are two American doctors who got 
infected with Ebola here, and they were in Suppository Liberia, and they were sent to US, and they are doing some research with them with a new product. But it's not approved yet, okay? It hasn't been proven humans before, which means that we don't know the effects of that. Okay. Maybe this is the big solution for all of us, but we need to keep on trying. You know that one drug, one medicament, before being used with real patients, has to go through a lot of processes of quality, as you can imagine. Because we cannot try one new drug with people. What happens if that person dies? What happens if I bring that serum here? I start giving to patients, and then the patients start dying, or start having some kind of complication or adverse effect. Okay, I'm not allowed to do that. We can do it in specific cases, like these two doctors, American doctors in the US, one Spanish priest who went back to Spain, but he died yesterday. Anyway. So, this is not a miracle. No, because I, I've written a lot of things in media and I, I feel so frustrated and so upset when they are just trying to, lay, to, to lie to their people. Because this is not a treatment, this is something experimental that they are trying in animals. And they can try in some humans, but we cannot talk about this as a real treatment because it's not, because we don't know the effects. So there's no treatment right now. Yes. Yeah. Okay. What we do and what we recommend is if you don't have any ambulance or any vehicle to take him and you're going to take out a to take that person or just yourself. Just try to cover the body with plastic or paper or something that old. If you can find gloves, that would be amazing, okay? But just try to cover the body all over you can and try to avoid touching skin to skin, okay? And then, when you take that person to the hospital, then you have to wash yourself. At least with water and soap. If you have to read, better. But dilute the chlorine with some water because otherwise it's quite strong. <coughs> okay. But anything that that person touches should be washed with chlorine, and that's enough. Okay. Okay. No, I explained before, like. You are in this situation, these are the soldiers inside your body, and you don't have symptoms until you have a real army inside your body. So the incubation period is when you are recruiting soldiers, so you don't transmit, because you still cannot attack. You cannot attack until you have a big army of people just to attack. So unless you have symptoms, if you see someone healthy, you cannot transmit the whole life. Yes. Oh, that's a very good, very good question because it's what I explained before. So that's why we isolate people who have these symptoms and we take the sample. We don't send to Kenema and Kailan everyone with this symptoms because of what you say. Because maybe we are wrong. I can tell you, we have an isolation room in Connor with 13 beds. And normally we have around seven patients, and only one then being positive. The six of them, the rest of the six, are negative, and they are sent home, or they are given other treatments afterwards. So that's why we isolate someone during two, three days until we get the result, 
If it's positive, it's sent to the animal and they die. If it's negative, we treat them from other things or we send them home. Okay, so then it doesn't rely on the decision of the doctor. The doctor decides if I need to isolate you or not. That's my responsibility, okay? So that's why right now we are isolating a lot of patients who are negative because we cannot we cannot assume the responsibility of sending to the normal hospital to someone who has Ebola. Imagine all the nurses that can be infected. And the patients in the beds around, they share probably the same towels or the same bathroom. Or, you know, it's really risky. So every time that we see someone with fever, diarrhea, vomiting, weakness, and any, any clue of having been in contact with a patient who has died suddenly or a funeral or has been sick or whatever, we isolate that person and we do the test. But the person has to be isolated while I'm waiting the test. Because if it's positive, I have to make all my best to try to prevent that person to contain, to infect all people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna explain that because my, my friend Kelly just got me the PP and everything. But the thing is, this is the second part of the before I started with the second part with your question. Um I want to know if it's possible for the virus to be transmitted by a so from somebody who's very, very key. Yeah. Is it possible for a mosquito to transmit the virus from somebody who's very, very key? As I told you before, it doesn't live too long. In, out of the body. So we haven't had any contact at all with mosquitoes. At all. The virus died before. Doesn't doesn't transmit like that. But that's a very good question. Because malaria is transmitted that way. So yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Mamas who have Ebola cannot breastfeed the children because it can be transmitted. <laughs> and also, there's one thing, it's transmitted by sexual weight. So, one person having sex with someone can transmit it. But there's one difference between this weight and the rest of the weights, okay? Like, the virus lives in the semen, in the man secretions, for six, seven weeks after getting recovered. So, we, every time that we discharge patients that they have survived, they cannot have sex for two, three months. Because they can transmit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
they have had many other cases. So right now we have a niece here who had a big test for NASA fever. But they both left the first time in the country. And the outbreaks have not been very big, so there has not been research enough to create this test. I think that's, that's the future. We need people like you to have that idea and start working on that. Yeah. Yes. No, no. You need virus. You need virus into that. It's the same like this. Why it's get okay, I'm gonna explain you some physiological thing. Okay. The semen is created in the in the eggs, no? The balls. The testicles. Okay. So the thing is, uh between the moment you create the semen and the moment you discharge it could pass three, four weeks. When you create the semen, it's when that liquid is in contact with blood inside the body. So that's why you can even discharge it in the face and you can even transmit. Okay? But it's because the virus, the, the quantity of virus is quite high then when it was created. But it was kept inside the hole. Okay? So that's why you can keep on transmitting it. But not in the inflation period. You need to have a lot of virus inside. Okay? Yeah. And I want to ask, are there many isolation rooms? for you to like provide for the patient or you're gonna place the same patient in the one that like you're proven positive sorry uh, we have a big i didn't talk about corners okay we have a big isolation room with 13 beds and we separate them by plastic and we try that the patients are not in contact one with the other and also we have like three different levels like here's the low risk like probably you have malaria or typhoid, but I'm just isolating you just in case. The middle, which is like, mm -hmm, maybe you can have Ebola, and the third part is when I'm completely sure because your wife and your daughter had died of Ebola last week. So the normal thing is that you have Ebola. So they have. So it's like our unit is like three different rooms for these patients. Okay. And also in Kerala and Kailan, they they try to separate the patients also between them. But only confirmed cases go there. Okay? It's different to Kerala. In Kerala we also have people who are negative. But there, they only have positive cases. Yeah. How long do you feel so this out to get to last? I think it's gonna be at least
And then you can reflect on that, like how we have to wear, how we have to be dressed to be able to treat patients with the COVID. Okay? And also this can be extrapolated to people who do funerals, like burials. Also the ambulance staff who go to pick up patients from places and take them to the others. And also then you can think of how to dress yourself at home if you have one suspected case. <laughs> now we show you the very technical and professional way of doing it. And then you can try to figure out how to do this in your home, just in case one time you find someone and that was what you just report. But how to take this person to the health center. Okay? okay? So first of all, The first thing that we do is we try to protect our clothes from the patient. So we have a super cute and amazing dress, very elegant and bright, as you can see very clean. Okay, this is gonna cover from here. <laughs>
Maybe but you told uh, some doctors and nurses got infected. Why? Okay, I'm going to show you something, okay? Imagine, so now that we have dressed, now I'm going to show you how to get undressed. Because there's one thing very important, and it's that he has been in contact with the hands, with the patient. So, focus here, focus here, okay? has been helping one patient, probably a bone is also here. Okay. The shield that covers, I'm being covered with the floor, and the floor probably has pieces or blood or whatever, so the virus is there. So, getting dressed is really easy. What happens with a dress? Because you have to make sure that you don't touch anything of your body, okay, when you get undressed. So, we use bleach, chlorine, as I told you before, because we know that that's the only thing that kills the virus. Heat, chlorine, and sun. Okay? So, we have... We have one bucket like this, okay? So, no, no, no. We have one bucket, we have like a room. You see all the patients, you go like this, don't touch yourself. And then we get outside, okay? And then you see we have buckets, many of them, by the way, with bleach and water, okay, or chlorine and water. The first thing that you do is you wash your hands. Yeah, like this. Yeah? Put them inside the water. What happens now? We are killing the virus that is in our cup. Okay? Yeah. You have to do this all the time that you get undressed. It takes you half an hour to get undressed. Almost one time. Okay? So yeah. So I I'm lying to you. We have also an apron like this. It's not wet enough. So he has washed his hands the virus with the bleach and water and now he takes the apron but he has to take it from the sides because if something is here if it touches he has a bone in his hands again okay so take your apron from the left from the sides they are plastic aprons okay so you take it you throw it in the bin this is the trash bin and what do you do now you wash your hands again Okay. Okay. Now, now, you guess, okay, you have your shoes on it, so, yeah, so, you start unzipping your, your dress, okay, get in. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.
brother has just passed out of from life in Canada. So I would like you to come over and then try to come in. Okay, I'm all right. Two, three. I'm all right, you're good. Where is your suspect? Where is your suspect? Where is your suspect? Where is your suspect? That's the body.